New York Times got an advanced copy of former Vice President Dick Cheney's memoir, an assignment which I hope included a hardship pay bonus. According to the Times write-up in the book, Cheney gives readers a vision of the world in which he was a lone, courageous visionary surrounded by cowards and imbeciles. He says CIA Director George Tenet's decision to resign when, quote, the going got tough was unfair to the president. He takes credit for helping to push out Secretary of State Colin Powell after the 2004 election, and he throws Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice under the bus for trying to get a nuclear weapons agreement with North Korea. He even throws in a condescending line about how she, quote, came into my office, sat down in the chair next to my desk, and tearfully admitted I had been right. Cheney also defends torture, or what he calls tough interrogations. In your view, we should still be using enhanced interrogation? Yes. No regrets? No regrets. Should we still be waterboarding terror suspects? I would uh, strongly support using it again if circumstances arose where we had a, a high-value detainee and that was the only way we could get him to talk. Even though so many people have condemned it, people call it torture, you think it should still be a tool? Yes. When I saw the article yesterday about Cheney's book, I dashed off an email in a fit of pique to some friends who work in publishing, saying basically, everyone at Simon & Schuster, which is publishing the book, should be ashamed of themselves. Now, upon further consideration, I think that's too harsh. The entire Simon & Schuster company isn't responsible for one division publishing one book. But I think the reason I got so angry, what's so troubling about this Cheney publicity lab, is the fact that he has managed to escape not only legal sanction for advocating and overseeing the implementation of the war crime, that is torture, but that he also has appeared to manage to escape social sanction as well. Everyone is now going to treat him as just another memoirist for the books to sell, and he'll have his book party and give his interviews and cash his checks as if he were Keith Richards. What would someone in power have to do to put themselves outside the bounds of polite society? When powerful people are not held to account, when they have no worry about their reputations, it creates a moral hazard, not unlike what's happened with the banks. Anti-social behavior is rewarded, failure is also rewarded, and we're trapped inside a system of perverse incentives. So Dick Cheney can openly defend and advocate torture and profit off of it just in time for the 10th anniversary of September 11th. Joining me now is Glenn Greenwald, a columnist for Salon.com. Glenn, thanks so much for coming on. It's good to be here, Chris. Uh, Cheney gave an interview to NBC about the book. I'm going to play you this sound. This book is going to make a lot of people angry. There are going to be heads exploding all over Washington, Jim. <laughs> you know that. Yes. I feel like this sort of notion that the heads are exploding sort of reduces the complaint against Cheney to some sort of standard partisan invective. What do you think? I mean, that's the critical issue, Chris. Let's just be very clear about what it is that Dick Cheney did. He directly participated by his own boastful account in the implementation of a domestic spying program that subjected thousands of Americans on U.S. soil to having their emails read and telephone calls listened to by government agents without the warrants required by the criminal law. The institution of the worldwide torture regime went way beyond waterboarding. It included a whole variety of techniques that the U.S. has constantly prosecuted other people and other nations for using, and according to General Barry McCaffrey, it was one whereby we, quote, murdered dozens of people in our custody. And then he was the driving force behind a war of aggression, an attack on Iraq that ended the lives of at least 100,000 innocent human beings and and far more. And and what's so troublesome is, is exactly what you just said, which is we decided now to treat those like simple policy disputes, like mistakes that he made, rather than what they are, which is among the most serious and egregious crimes committed over the last decade, if not in, in this generation. I mean, there's a statute in place that said if you eavesdrop on Americans without warrants, you go to prison for five years for each offense. We have a treaty that requires that we will prosecute all people who order torture. Um, General Taguba, who, who was tasked with investigating this, said that there's no doubt that high Bush officials created war crimes. The 
the only question is whether they'll be held to account. And then in the Nuremberg trials after World War II, the U.S. prosecutor in charge of that tribunal said the worst crime is not genocide or bombing hospitals or anything else. It is uh, a war of aggression. That is the kingpin crime, and yet Dick Cheney is in the middle by his own proud admission of all of those crimes, and, and yet we don't treat him like a criminal. We instead immunize him from his crimes and, and treat him like a celebrity and, and reward him for it. Uh, how much do you think, and you wrote about this today in Salon.com, where, where your blog is, you, you write about the sort of look forward, not backward mantra, which has generally been the, the posture of the Obama administration, although I think that wasn't necessarily the posture in the beginning and has certainly become the posture. How much do you think that contributes to this sort of this kind of um, normalizing of, of, of what Cheney ha has done and continues to defend? It's easily the biggest factor. I mean, if you look at theories of criminal law, um, I mean, imagine if, for example, we decided to announce tomorrow that we were no longer going to prosecute murder or rape or child abductions because we didn't want to keep looking backward. We wanted only to look forward. What would you think would happen? Obviously, there'd be a lot more people engaging in murder, rape, and child abduction because the deterrence against doing that has been removed. We've decided we're not going to prosecute that. What we've done in American political culture, ever since Gerald Ford pardoned Richard Nixon to the cheers of most media figures, um, is have decided that our highest political officials are free to break the law without consequences. We saw that with Iran-Contra as well and a whole variety of other instances. And so when Barack Obama got into office and essentially began pressuring the Justice Department through all kinds of means not to prosecute Bush officials for all of the crimes that I began by describing, he has continued this evisceration of the rule of law for political elites at the same time that ordinary Americans are imprisoned by the same government, the same state, at rates greater than any country in the entire world. And, and so political elites like Dick Cheney know that they will not, they can commit crimes and, and with total impunity and that's why he goes around proudly boasting about the crimes he's committed because President Obama has made clear that neither he nor anyone else in the administration will be prosecuted for those very serious um, breaches of the criminal law. I guess my final question is, g given that state of affairs, <laughs> given the sort of um, consensus of normality that has seemed to sort of now settled in over the policy disputes of torture um, and illegal wiretapping, et cetera, how do you begin to culturally counteract that, if that's, if that's not too broad a question? Because th this, this notion of how you kind of mark off what is over some line in, in polite society is a really tricky one, but I feel like there has to be some sort of concerted effort, at least among critics and intellectuals and other people paying attention, that does that. Well, law is supposed to be, of course, the principal way that yes. we say there are certain lines that you cannot cross, right? I mean, there are certain things that are impolite that might result in social stigma, but there are certain things that you can't do that are far worse than impolite. They're criminal, and you're supposed to go to prison for them. And we've erased those lines. But as you've suggested, we've erased an even more disturbing line, which is even the idea of a social stigma. So, you know, we love in American politics and American political discourse to talk about other countries' leaders and the horrible crimes they've committed committed and look at what these dictators are doing and these awful people in that other country are doing. And yet we have political leaders, a leader, a class of leaders who have committed what we've always said, what we Americans have always said for decades are among the worst and most egregious crimes. And independent of, of the law, the, the legal immunity, you're absolutely right. You won't see barely any media figures treating Dick Cheney with even the smallest degree of hostility or animosity. He will be treated like any other elder statesman who might have some political controversial positions, but he won't be shunned by anyone. And what that guarantees is that that behavior becomes normalized. Both parties have accepted it by not prosecuting it, um, and, and I think that's a very dangerous thing to do. Glenn Greenwald of Salon has a book coming out very soon, which you are going to want to read. Thanks for joining me tonight. Really appreciate it. Great to be with you, Chris. Coming up. The